Thank you, Sam. Thank you for praying for us, Jay. And uh, welcome back to See You Night, uh, as, uh, or See You Live, I should say. As uh, Sam's already said, we're continuing our series through Matthew's Gospel, towards the end of the Gospel, actually, The Surprising Jesus. And the question uh, we're looking at tonight, what God wants for us, or the statement what God wants for us or wants for you, is probably a bit counterintuitive. We're probably more used to thinking about uh, what we want from God, or if we thought that there is a God, if we weren't sure about that, but if we sort of hypothesize that there might be a God, well, what difference would that make to me? We're sort of flipping that tonight and thinking of it from God's perspective, what God wants for you. And I actually want to start tonight uh, by looking at a quote, and this will be up on uh, your screens, I hope now. Yes, there it is. Uh, Here is Helmut Tillich, and uh, he's reflecting on the parables of Jesus, particularly the parable that we're going to be looking at of the uh, great wedding banquet in Matthew 22. And he says these words, the dream of the kingdom of God has moved people's minds in every age. It extends all the way from the thoughts of the millennial kingdom in the last book of the Bible to Karl Marx's classless society and workers paradise. And always it is the same deep yearning that is reflected in it. Someday the mystery of suffering, the mystery of madhouses, mass graves, the mystery of widows and orphans must be illuminated. Someday must come the hereafter where we shall learn all the answers. Someday the paralyzing contradiction between justice on the one hand and life's blind game of chance on the other must be reconciled. Someday the tension between rich and poor, between the sunny side of life and the gloomy zones of horror must be equalised. Every great political and cultural ideal has in it something of the hope and the light of this final fulfilment. But the kingdom of God is not a state or condition of this world, not an ideal order of nations and life, but it centres about a person the King, God himself. What does God want for you? What is this about God's kingdom? Jesus came announcing that the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. But what's so good about the good news? What's so good about God's kingdom? What's so good about God? What does God want for us? Well, when God's people, Israel, were in exile under foreign rule, under his judgment, God invited them to share his vision for the future. Those who had ears to hear, those who would turn to him, he invited them to share his vision for the future. That is what he would do through his chosen one, his anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, descended from King David. What God would do not just for the nation of Israel, but through Israel and through her Messiah for all the nations of the world. So what I want us to do, before we come to Matthew, I want us to hear this invitation, this gracious invitation that God gave his people. And if you think about Jesus' parable as a parable of the wedding banquet, this could be a description of what was on the invitation to that banquet. So let's read God's invitation now from Isaiah 55. It will appear on the bottom of the screen as I read. Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live." 
I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Do you hear it there in those promises, in that invitation? God is not stingy God doesn't play tricks on us God is not a wowser out to deny us of that which will truly bring us joy in life God does not deny us what is best for us God is not a taker God is a giver and he gives us everything ultimately in his son the Lord Jesus He invites us to a great feast. Did you hear it there? The great feast with wine and food beyond all imagining. Expensive food that you don't pay for. You are his guest. We hear about this banquet that we're invited to in Matthew 22. The marriage feast for the wedding of the son of the king his heir and you are invited i'm going to invite jay to come up now and read uh, this parable of jesus for us from matthew 22 so please have your bibles open that'd be great thanks jay thank you andy um today's uh passage just as andy said is from matthew 22 verse 1 to 14. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. When he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murders and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding wedding banquet is ready, but those who are invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, 
How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Thank you, Jay, for reading God's word to us. Well, if you read Matthew's gospel, any of the four gospels, it's very clear what Jesus came to do. He came proclaiming the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's the same idea that the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. And he came doing the deeds of the kingdom, didn't he? Here is the king establishing his kingdom. Uh, all those signs of broken and fallen people once again being brought under God's uh, loving rule, being restored. So the deaf heard because Jesus healed them. The blind could see again. The lame could walk. Those who were possessed and, and tyrannized by evil spirits were delivered by Jesus, who is Lord over all. Those who had run out of chances, those who were in the category sinners, notorious sinners, people who, it seems, had gone too far to ever come back to God. They were finding forgiveness and were receiving a fresh start with God through Jesus. And the response that Jesus called for continually was to repent and believe the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. Know your real need, Jesus said, as he shows us our real need. Know that only I can give you the forgiveness and the life that you need. Only I can restore you to God's people. Turn back to God. That's what repent means. Do the 180. Turn back to God and believe in him. Trust in him. Well, we also know reading Matthew's gospel, and we saw it last week with the parables of the, of the vineyard, that when Jesus Messiah, Jesus the Christ, great David's greatest son, came to that which was his own, as John's gospel puts it, the house of Israel, Jerusalem and her inhabitants, many did not receive him. Remember from last time, Jesus told parables. Why did he use parables? To explain what was happening as God's kingdom was coming and why different people were responding in the way that they were. Tiliku, we heard a quote from at the very start, called the parables of Jesus God's picture book. And last week we had this vivid picture of the vineyard, a strong picture in the Bible. And we heard Jesus say things like this, the last will be first and the first will be last. He's saying to religious people, the people who thought that they had the front row seats to the kingdom, sinners are entering the kingdom of God before you. In fact, he goes so far as to say the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce fruit. And those people are the unlikely ones, the people you would think would be the least likely to become part of God's people, bad people who are now forgiven and transformed people, people who know God's love for them, know that they are loved much, and they begin to love much. It's time for our next uh, screen shot. We've got another theologian coming up now, another Bible commentator and preacher. Don Carson writes this. If the parable of the tenants in Matthew 21 exposes Israel's leaders' neglect of their covenantal duty, this one in Matthew 22 condemns the contempt with which Israel as a whole treats God's grace. Okay, so let's come to this parable now. Let's dig into it uh, and uh, see what Jesus is saying. We read in verse 1, Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. This is not just any banquet. 
This is a wedding banquet. Very special to receive a wedding invitation. And this is not just any wedding banquet. This is an invitation to the wedding of the king's son, the heir of the future heir of the kingdom. Now, I don't know if you can imagine being invited to a royal wedding. I reckon that's quite hard to imagine. And what kind of people are invited to a royal wedding? So I, I have prepared something earlier to help us in that. I'm just going to move over here. Just going to do some quick changes. Uh, you'll see there the neutral tones of the back of the St. Jews. Oh, a bit of the the edge of a costume tank there. And uh, what, what kind of people would you expect to be invited to a royal... Well, thank you, Your Majesty. It's great to be in Windsor again for this reception for your son. We are honoured as a family. Yes, the cane, yes, the gout playing up again. No polo this year, I'm afraid, but it's a wonderful occasion. But I do notice that there are some... There's some new money around. There's some of those, uh, some of those colonists, some of those uh, movie, movie folk around. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but uh, very honoured to be here and looking forward to the hunt later on. So thank you, Your Majesty. The, the, maybe something like that is what you're imagining. That's, that's what I imagine. I, I don't expect that I'll be... I don't expect that I'll be invited ever to a royal wedding, but that's, that's the kind... Thank you. Thank you for that. But that's the kind of person I can imagine being invited to a royal wedding. But forget about that. That's nothing. Forget about top hats and tails and strange canes and gout. We're talking about the ancient Near East. This kind of hospitality, these kind of weddings went on for days, sometimes weeks. And you have been invited to the table of the king. That is the picture that Jesus is painting. And not a constitutional monarch who knights rock stars. We're talking about absolute power. This is real power going on here. No offence to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And as I say, this banquet would go on for days and weeks. And so it's the kind of invitations as people are hearing, you're going, no one's going to knock back that invitation. Uh, you, you need to be here. This is somewhere you want to be. In fact, the king has requested your presence. You actually need to be at this banquet. So how do these privileged guests respond to this invitation? I can't wait to see. Let's have a look. Verse 3. He sent his servants to those who'd been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who've been invited that I prepared my dinner, my oxen and fattened ca cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king sends out his servants bit like servants going to the vineyard, his mouthpieces, they carry his words, his invitation. And the first response to the king's invitation is just out and out refusal. No, we don't want this great event that you've put on, that you're inviting us to. We want no part in the celebration of your son. Now understand the enormity of this knockback. This is not just impoliteness. This is not just snubbing someone, even snubbing someone that's really important. If you snubbed Queen Elizabeth in a confronting and rude way, you'd get on all the chat shows and that'd last at least for 24 hours. I'm not talking about that kind of impoliteness here. Even more than sort of a, a political upset here, this is an act of disloyalty. This is an act of treason. This is your king. His son is the heir to the throne. At this point, you're acting like a rebel. Do you live in this king's kingdom or not? Or are you a pretender? Are you a kind of a usurper or an enemy of the state or something? You're not just saying no to a, a party. You're saying no to the king, your rightful ruler, whose plans for his kingdom 
will necessarily affect you because he is the king. But you see, this king is determined that his son be honoured. The feast will continue. It must go on. So remarkably, graciously, he persists with his people. He, he sends out more servants. Look, okay, you've got the invitation. And then the custom was you sent out the initial invitation. Then when everything is prepared, when the meat's being sliced, the servants are standing to attention, the wine's about to be poured, then you call people in and say, okay, it's ready the feast is on. Everyone come in now. And they go and gather up all the people to come in. Surely now, with this next official moment, they'll come to the banquet. No, actually. Now they simply ignore the king. Maybe they don't even know that the servants turn up at their house because they're busy. They've got to get on with the stuff of life. They've, they've literally got to get on with the business of life, their own little kingdoms far more important got to make money got to build houses got to extend fields got to invest for the future got to be future proof attend to the crops attend to your health educate the children these aren't loud rebels are they in the sense that they're not spraying offensive words on the palace walls or throwing dung across the dinner table and then running off snickering or something they're not loud uh, rebels in that sense in fact they're good respectable hard-working people getting on with what looks to me like normal life there's nothing wrong with working you need to work you need to earn money you need to be able to have somewhere to live Nothing wrong with that. But this is normal life being lived without any reference to the king and his son and to the kingdom to which they supposedly belong. And there's everything wrong with that. They don't seem to care. How long do they think that life will go on as normal while they deny their king? while they deny reality, while they deny the rightness and the goodness of his rule, of his kingdom. But of course, there are loud rebels as well, aren't there? Rebels who do actively and even violently oppose the king. They want to send a message. You don't rule us. We rule ourselves, thank you very much. This is what we think of you, O king, and your son and his wedding. See what we do with your servants? We spit on them. We put them in prison if we want to. We kill them if we want to. Verse 6. Whether quietly or loudly or politely or rudely, the actions of all these invited guests amounts to the same thing treason they all reject the offer of this banquet and try to just get on with their life and run the world without reference to their king what will the king do what will he do now will he call off the banquet Will he admit defeat? Will he surrender his kingdom to rebels? Will he carve it up so that every person can be their own king? Lawless, divided, inevitably warring against one another. Because if I say I'm king and, and Jay and Sam say they're kings, well, there's only room even in this big room for one king. There's going to be a war. No, there's only room for one true king. Only one can rightly rule. And this king is committed to his kingdom and the future with his son. And the punishment for treason against his rule is death. That's the next part of the parable. Verse 7, the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. You see, the king is also the judge. He must uphold his kingdom and the honour of his son. So is that it? Is it all over? 
Well, before we look at the next part of the parable, I think we need a short break. And I think instead of uh, Andy's exercise, tonight uh, we're going to have some book reviews. And uh, I'll just uh, get organised for the book reviews. So please enjoy the uh, beige or grey coloured wall while I get organised. It won't take long. Oh, thank you very much. You heard from that toff before. Now you're going to hear from me to get some good book learning into you. Yeah, that Andy goes on a bit, doesn't he, anyway? I, I, I like reading the Bible, like any guy does, I guess, but I like reading books that help me to read the Bible. You know what I'm saying? And I try, I want to have a library where I have two kinds of books that Andy calls them and other commentaries. I call them conversation partners, except they are not sort of walking around the room, they sit on my bookshelf. So I can interact with them, I can read the Bible for myself, and then I can read what they say. But if I don't agree with them, just because they're in print, doesn't mean they're right, does it? Because I've got the Bible and the Holy Spirit at work in me. Yes, so what kind of commentaries do you want? I think what you want, what you really want, I'll tell you what you want. You want, I'll tell you, I'll t you want me to tell, because I'll tell you, you want a short commentary that gets, unlike Andy, it gets to the point. More like, your, say, your Rob Miller. It gets to the point. Andy goes on a bit, right? He's all right. You know, it takes all sorts, as me dear old mum would say. Hello, mum. But I like a short one that gets to the point. This is by a guy called Don Carter. I think you saw his picture before. He had his glasses off. It's called God With Us. Themes from Matthew. But it's just an example of a short one, just a few pages on each section. You read the passage for yourself. You see what he's got to say. And then you bounce off that like a, like a rubber ball, you know what I'm saying? That's a good one. Another short one. This one's on all the Gospels. It's only that thin, but all of the, well, the what they call the synoptics, Matthew, Mark and Luke are in this one. This is William J. Dumble. He's an Australian. He's one of you geezers, right? And this guy, this is great because he, you read it and it's like putting the Gospels in the context of God's big picture story of the covenant in the Old New Testament. It's called the New Covenant, the synoptics in God context. Again, it gets to the point. Doesn't waffle on like your Andy over there. Even short, sure, look how thin this is. This is Australian as well. A guy called Mike Ray. Yeah, many of you know him personally. I know him personally. He's a good geezer. Born in Liverpool. Yeah, where the Beatles come from. He knows what's going on. Anyway, he wrote this book on Matthew. And look, each page, it's only one little page for each bit, but very deep and profound and useful. That's called Matthew, All Authority. Journey through Matthew with Mike Rader. And you're a good old geezer, Mike. If you're out there tonight, thanks for that one. Oh, he's a guy. This guy's dead now, but that's all right. He's with the Lord now, and that's a good thing. He was a bishop, but he was a good bishop. Not saying bishops are bad as a rule, but this was a good one. Had a really long beard. He was also the Bishop of Liverpool way before the Beatles, but that's all right. We're going to see a picture of him later. But he wrote a series of things called expository thoughts on the Gospels, and Andy tells me that this is one of the most inspiring things that he read to prepare for this. Just a couple of pages on each page. You see what I'm trying to say? You have the brief ones to get to the point. But then sometimes you need a bit more detail. You need to put up with someone like Andy and so you have something longer. And Don Carson wrote the short one, wrote a longer one, right? So when you want to you check out a few other things, you want to go a bit deep, then you have a longer one as well. So you have a shorter one and a longer one. Go for the good authors. If you're not sure, you can Google in with the googly goo and we'll, you know, you, you get to know the good authors. Don Carson, he's a right good geezer. Mike Raider, he's a good Dumbrell, J.C. Ryle, you can't go wrong. Commentaries, they don't have all the answers, but a wise head and conversation partner, all right? There they go. All right, so be good and uh, don't be wandering around the streets and, and keep going on your book learning. And we'll get back to the talk. Okay, thanks for it. Well, 
Well, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, look, apologies, but look, we'll get back into it. But, uh, you know, his heart was in the right place, wasn't it? For some reason, my hair's a bit messed up. So let's resume. Let's come back to Matthew 22. Let's centre, let's focus. I'm going to quote Don Carson. We're up to the end of verse 7. The king's wish to assign honour to the son had to be satisfied. The hall had to be filled. We just heard a word of judgment. Here we hear a word of grace. Chapter two, 22 and verse 8. Have a, have a listen. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. I love this image that Jesus is painting here. It's truly extraordinary. The king's generosity is spilling out. He must share the joy of the marriage of his son. And it spills out into unexpected places. People who would never have expected to even get near to the palace, who wouldn't even know what a top hat was, are now being invited to the table of the king's son. Imagine if Queen Elizabeth sent one of her own attendants to me in Druin and said, Andy, come to the banquet. You can't imagine it, can you? It's just a bit strange, but let's push it. Imagine if she sent her personal attendants to the brothels of London and said to those working there, come to the banquet. To the guy sleeping on Swanston Street who smells like urine mixed with metho, come to the banquet. Sit at my table. Come up here. Sit next to me. I want you to meet my son. The servants, Jesus says, went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests, verse 10. What's the criteria here? Is it wealth? No. Is it fame? No. Is it status? No. Is it moral excellence? No. The good and the bad are gathered in, aren't they? What is the criteria? Well, it's all to do with what's coming out of the king's heart. It's the king's criteria. It's totally his initiative. And when you come to this banquet, you come as you are. But notice that you don't stay the same. There's a dress code. We hear a bit mysteriously in a moment about wedding garments, special clothes that show that you're meant to be there, that you understand that this is not just some party. No, you're wearing wedding garments because you know that you're here to celebrate, to join in in the celebration of the wedding of the son of the king. Jesus fills out the parable a bit more in verse 11. But when the king came in to the banquet to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a gate crasher. How can you tell? They're not wearing the wedding clothes. They might be there for the party, the great food, the free booze, but they're not there as a guest. They're not there on the king's terms, which defeats the whole purpose of being there. You're not just there to have a party. You're there to celebrate the king. You're there to celebrate his son. And really what Jesus shows here is that the gate crasher is really actually like one of those first group, few groups of people who said they were too busy or just didn't want to be there in the first place. And so the king throws him out into that world, apart from the king's banquet, a world of their own making, a fool's paradise, 
that does not deliver freedom but slavery, not light, but only darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this is the sting in the tail of Jesus' parable, where he gives us the point of what he's saying here. Verse 14, for many are invited, but few are chosen. Now, we need to understand that statement in the context of the parables that Jesus has been teaching, the context of his parables in chapters 21 and 22 with the vineyard, to understand his point with the parable here. Remember, his primary audience at this point well, has been to the leaders in Israel and now to the people in Israel gathered in Jerusalem, to this nation. Jesus says what Isaiah said long ago to her ancestors that would go into exile. You've been part of Israel. Yes, you've enjoyed the benefits of being part of God's people, life in the land. But in the actual practice of your lives, you've been ignoring God. You've been faithless. You've been disobedient. You've been destroying one another in your greed and in your self-centeredness. And you've failed to be a light to the nations. And now that great David's greatest son is here, holding out the offer of forgiveness and a fresh start with God, you reject him. You don't want to come to the party, especially the kinds of parties that Jesus goes to. Do you know in Luke's gospel, Jesus is getting a reputation for being a drunkard and a glutton because he was hanging out with all the wrong people. But don't you see that, don't we see that all our righteousness by which we sort of put ourselves above others before God, as the prophet Isaiah says in another place, is like filthy rags. Many are invited, few are chosen. The nation, the city, and even the temple would be decimated under God's judgment as he gave them over to what they chose. But God has a chosen remnant. And that remnant will be like a new bud coming out of the the dead hewn off stump of Israel. Son of David, the one anointed with God's spirit. And the people which grows from him will become a great tree bigger than Israel ever was. It would include the 12 and more and more of God's people would turn to him and live. And then the Gentiles would stream in. Isaiah 55 verse 5, you will summon nations you know not. Nations you do not know will hasten to you. People from every tribe and language and nation from places that they could could never have imagined. As Paul would say later, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Those words are even truer now, aren't they? Wagadougou and Burkina Faso, perhaps atheists in China, perhaps Muslims in the Middle East, even secular materialists in Melbourne, Victoria. When Jesus meets us, He meets us as we are, for as the hymn says, we can't come any other way. We might be able to fool ourselves, put on a costume, might be able to fool our mums even, although that's pretty tricky to do, or our friends or the the culture around us, but God sees the heart. But when we meet Jesus, he doesn't leave us the same. In Jesus' parable, it's the wedding banquet of the king's son. There's a dress code. It's God's kingdom. They become a forgiven people who are changed to live for God now. What happened to the blind who Jesus healed? They could see again. The deaf could hear, the lame could walk. What happened to sinners, people like Zacchaeus or Mary Magdalene? They left their life of sin and followed Jesus. See, to use one of Paul's images, if we are clothed with the garments of Christ's righteousness that he freely gives us through his death for us that covers all our sin, we also receive his spirit and we are increasingly transformed into his image. We put sin to death. We put on Christ. 
Another clothing image that Paul uses in Colossians 3. We keep in step with the Spirit. We walk in the way of love in the good works He's prepared in advance for us to walk in. Now, I made fun of royal weddings before, and that's what Aussies do, isn't it? We're not used to hearing stories about absolute monarchs and their kingdoms. This is not a paradigm that most Australians are happy to work with. And of course, it's true that any other person speaking like Jesus would be someone you need to run away from very quickly. They'd either be some kind of a, a wicked dictator or, or some kind of cult leader. What did C.S. Lewis say about Jesus? Can we see him as just a good moral teacher? No. Listen carefully to his parables. This man is either a liar a lunatic, or he is Lord. The Gospel of Matthew tells us Jesus is Lord. It shows us Jesus is the loving Lord, the servant king who came not to be served but to serve, not to take but to give, even his life unto death on a cross. I want to quote from the uh, good bishop, J.C. Ryle, now. Let's see his wonderful bearded image on the screen. I love the way that he summarizes the message of this parable. He says, There is in the gospel a complete provision for all the wants of a person's soul. There is a supply of everything that can be required to relieve spiritual hunger and spiritual thirst, pardon, Peace with God, lively hope in the world, glory in the world to come are set before us in rich abundance. It is a feast of fat things. All this provision is owing to the love of the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. He offers to take us in union with himself, to restore us to the family of God as dear children, to clothe us with his own righteousness to give us a place in his kingdom and to present us faultless before his father's throne at the last day. The gospel, in short, is an offer of food to the hungry, joy to the lost. It is glad tidings. God offers through his dear son to be at one with sinful people. And in just a few chapters' time, and of course next week, we will again Think about when Jesus willingly went to the cross to die in the place of sinners, my place and your place, to bring us to God, to give us a place, not just at a one-off state function, but a permanent place as a member of God's family, a permanent place at the table co-heirs with Christ, our older brother, sharing in his glory forever. Let me finish with this. There are many disappointments that we will face during this time. And one of the greatest will be not being able to go to the weddings of friends and family. But the greatest regret of your life would be to reject Christ to miss out on the wedding, to quite literally end all weddings. The great celebration of God and his people, the marriage between his son and the church. I'm going to finish now with some words from Revelation that describe this great banquet, and then I'm going to hand back to Sam, and hopefully we still have time for question time. That, that geezer who did the book review went on for a bit long. My, I'll speak to him later, but let's listen to God's word once more from Revelation chapter 19 and verse 5. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. 
Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb and he added these are the true words of God and the revelation of John indeed the whole Bible ends in this way he who testifies to these things says yes I am coming soon and his people say amen come Lord Jesus the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people amen